The world needs to decarbonize and it needs to do so fast in order to avoid planetary disaster. In the search for cleaner alternative fuels, many are pinning their hopes on hydrogen. Although its production still overwhelmingly relies on burning fossil fuels, proponents point to the fact that the only byproducts of consuming it are heat and water. No wonder the notoriously dirty aviation industry wants to get on board. This is a groundbreaking flight. The test pilots are off with the world's only aircraft that is powered solely by hydrogen. The modified glider belongs to the Stuttgart-based company H2 Fly. Liquid hydrogen is the energy source. And that is opening up new possibilities. What we see is that the storage technology in gaseous form essentially has a limit, allowing us to build aircraft with a range of about 1,000 kilometers. With the liquid hydrogen, we have an opportunity to cover longer distances and to continue aviation as we know it. Industry giants like Airbus are also looking for ways to use liquid hydrogen for green flying in the future. But that's not expected to happen before 2035. Before that, H2 Fly system will need to be smaller, more compact and practical for everyday use. In two years, H2 Fly aims to provide a carbon-neutral solution for a passenger aircraft, a DO-328. The maker of the 33-passenger plane sees it as a path to green flying. The current concept is we will have our fuel cells inside the cabin and then our hydrogen tank will be in the rear. So essentially we have the electric motors outboard. This is what we would call the power plant, powering those motors. And the job of the aircraft is to take all this equipment up to altitude and relevant conditions and test it. Competitors in the UK may be moving faster. At the beginning of this year, a smaller DO-228 completed a test flight there, albeit with one hydrogen engine and a traditional combustion engine. However, in just two years, the first regional aircraft are expected to be converted to hydrogen engines on a mass scale. That's earlier than in Germany, but some experts consider the timelines unrealistic, especially for startups. If you look at the technological development, we should definitely target the time frame around 2040. And I think there will be smaller aircraft sizes with 50 to 75, maybe 80 passengers. Smaller single-engine aircraft with fuel cells are likely to be available sooner, but they are not suitable for charter flights. The widespread transition to hydrogen involves much more than just the aircraft. We need to change the entire aviation ecosystem, the fuel supply, the energy supply for the new hydrogen aircraft concepts. Even though it is a long and costly journey, H2 Fly has demonstrated what's possible. The range has doubled from 700 kilometers with gaseous hydrogen to 1,500 kilometers with liquid hydrogen. While the technology is only available to test pilots, it's highly likely that by 2040 it will be used to fly travelers to holiday destinations. And it's not just the private sector that's betting on the potential of hydrogen. Here in Europe, lawmakers are keen to harness its power too. Scotland in particular sees huge potential in exporting the fuel, especially given the availability of wind power, which would enable it to produce the fuel cleanly. Earlier, I caught up with Scottish Cabinet Secretary for Energy, Neil Gray, who's hoping to drum up support for his country's hydrogen ambitions here in Germany. And also to distance himself from British Prime Minister Richie Sunak's recent decision to weaken the UK's climate goals. I have to begin by asking you for your reaction to British Prime Minister Richie Sunak's recent decision to weaken the UK's climate goals. Obviously, it was disappointing uh, that Richie Sunak took the decision to make uh, the, our journey to net zero in the UK another culture war issue. Um, I think in Scotland we've got a clear commitment to make sure that we reach net zero by 2045 and part of that is about making sure that we take uh, full use of the renewable energy resources that we have in terms
terms of offshore wind tidal, uh, pumped hydro storage and generating green hydrogen, which is why we're here uh, this week. So we want to work with the UK government on issues uh, such as the declaration that's been signed today between the UK and Germany on uh, hydrogen and make sure that we are playing our part in helping to decarbonise the energy production that's required, not just for the rest of the UK that we can hopefully help with export too, but also to our friends in Europe, uh, which is why I'm, I'm so keen to be here in Germany and speaking to, to stakeholders that we hope will, uh, will be able to take some of our green hydrogen. Now, Mr Sunak argued that the existing goals were simply too painful for ordinary citizens. I know that your portfolio includes economic well-being, and I'm curious to know how much pain do you think ordinary citizens should be expected to bear in the process towards decarbonisation? I think there's a great understanding in Scotland and in most parts uh, of uh, Europe and the rest of the world that for us to reach net zero and to take uh, the climate emergency that we're all facing seriously, we both need to decarbonise our energy production, so moving to renewable forms of energy, but also that we need to reduce our energy consumption. And so things like ensuring that our heat for our homes uh, is decarbonised and, and, and see a reduction is critically important. Also making sure that our modes of transport are decarbonised. That means changing the way that we live our lives and sometimes that is uncomfortable but people I think understand that it would be far less comfortable if we don't take this action. We continue to see uh, global warming and climate change happen and see the disastrous impacts of that in floods, uh, in uh, droughts and wildfires that we've seen this summer across Europe and elsewhere in the world. So let's talk about some of the solutions then. I know your country, Scotland, is a very windy one and you're hoping to harness that power in the service of exporting clean hydrogen. Tell me more about those plans. So I'm originally from Orkney, which is an island group off the north coast uh, of Scotland. And there uh, we have some of the windiest conditions uh, in Europe. And we uh, have an ambition to realise a substantial amount of offshore wind in particular, uh, looking to get 28 uh, gigawatts from the Scotland leasing round, which is the first uh, leasing round of offshore wind. Uh, that's going to see a substantial uh, overproduction of renewable uh, energy. We've also got a doubling of our onshore wind capacity coming in the coming years which again we'll see an overproduction of our, of our energy needs in Scotland so uh, we want to export some of that energy but also to uh, turn uh, a substantial amount five gigawatts by uh, 2030 to green hydrogen uh, and that obviously will help in decarbonizing some of our uh, usage in Scotland and the rest of the UK but also we hope uh, to help the decarbonization journey that our friends uh, here on the continent of Europe are also wanting uh, to go through so we know that Germany is going to be a critical uh, target market for us with that. We've already su seen substantial conversations uh, with stakeholders here that we think uh, may wish to take some of that green hydrogen. And critical to that is about how we transport it. And so I'm keen to talk uh, while I'm here this week about whether we can see a pipeline going from uh, the continent, going from here in Germany to Scotland. We're only seven, seven, 700, 750 kilometres, uh, a very short distance, uh, and we hope we'll be able to see the production of green hydrogen helping to decarbonise continental Europe. How much more difficult is it to negotiate deals of this kind outside of the EU? It's so obviously Scotland didn't want uh, to leave the European Union. Uh, my ambition is for an independent Scotland to return to the EU, obviously. Uh, in uh, the interim, uh, we're relying on the UK government to uh, come forward with trade negotiations uh, of the type that we're signing today, which is a declaration of intent on hydrogen. That's incredibly positive. Obviously, we'll continue to push the UK government to do more of this kind, to support the opportunity that Scotland has uh, to be a good global citizen, to make sure that we can uh, help uh, utilise the resources that we have to help our neighbours, in this case uh, in Germany, we hope. Uh, but obviously it would be much easier if we were inside the European Union, which is why we want to make sure in all of those trade negotiations that the UK government is conducting, that they are doing so aligning as closely as possible with the European standards, so that when Scotland is independent, we can have a seamless uh, return uh, to the European Union. Do you have the impression that that is happening? 
Uh, we hope so. I mean, this is a, a good deal that's been signed today, the, the declaration of intent. With This is a positive step. Uh, obviously, we want things to go much further and faster. We've, we're going to be contributing half of all of uh, the UK's uh, hydrogen potential over uh, the next decade. So obviously, this is a critically important industry to Scotland and the people of Scotland. Uh, we want to make sure that the UK government uh, holds up to its end of the bargain and we'll keep pushing for them to do so. Now, getting deals like this off the ground requires a huge amount of investment. Where is the money supposed to come from? Public investment is obviously going to be part of it, but we understand that private capital is going to be required. And we know that there is a substantial amount of private capital uh, worldwide that is looking for a home, particularly uh, on a net zero journey. So we're wanting to make sure that we have as clear a regulatory uh, situation in Scotland and the rest of the UK as possible, making sure that people understand that there is clear and consistent guidance around where we're going, which is why Rishi Sunak's intervention last week was so disappointing because for investors it was a backtrack and it was uncertainty. We want to give as much certainty as possible which is why I'm absolutely committed to our net zero objectives for 2045. We remain committed uh, to the, the steps that will need to be taken on energy production becoming renewable but also decarbonising the way we live our lives uh, and making sure that we've got certainty for investors going forward. Neil Gray, thank you very much for speaking with us. Thank you.